I don't know a safer place to be. I don't know a better place to reside at. Man, I, I was uh, I was awakened this morning. I, I don't even dream. And I woke up this morning about 3.30, one of the craziest dreams I ever had. It scared me. I thought it was for real. But I was in a somewhere, and all of a sudden, there was all kind of screaming and hollering and going on, and, and a lot of fear had me scared. And all of a sudden, someone popped up in a dream. And her name was Michelle, which is kind of like Michael. And uh, see, Michael means one like God, so she showed up as a woman named Michelle, and it said to me, because I'm laying there horrified. I missed all this stuff. And it said one word to me, it said, speak. Now, I don't know what that means to anybody else, but I think sometimes we talk a lot of death. And there was something about where I was at that moment with whoever the people were screaming, they were afraid. And that angel showed up and said, just speak life. You know, I, I think sometimes we, over, we underestimate when God tell you that in the power of the tongue, choose life. Because you're going to talk about what you have chosen. If you're choosing death, you're talking more about death. And so I realize a lot of times we are talking more death than we are about life. You know, I... I I'm sure I've been guilty many times of speaking death more than life. Because it seems like we're fascinated by death and yet everybody does it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It would seem like by now we are used to it because it happens. But we'd rather center our thoughts on death than life. And if you're not careful, you'll get up talking death to God when you ought to be speaking life. I said that because that has nothing to do with the message, I don't think. But I just thought I'd share this. Since I was awakened so early with that, maybe it was for me and not for you. But if you have your Bibles, I want to preach just a little bit. Praise God. God is so good, you know. The simplicity of just having faith in God brings about so much complication in our mind. And you, you don't realize how much change needs to take place in our lives when we get saved. But most of us have the concept that King Saul had. We want to decide what to keep, what's good for God, and all the time, God already knows what's good for him. And not only that, he knows what's good for you. But most of our lives is like King Saul. We want to be a king, but we want to pick and choose what we're going to give God and what we're going to kill. And the only thing God wanted is that I don't want to hear no sound. And I think our problem today is that he hears too much bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen, things that were supposed to be already gone, sacrificed. And we're trying to wait that ultimate day when we'll make that ultimate sacrifice because most average Christian is saying, one of these days, I'm going to get it all together. Yet most people I know is that they will say this, I'm not quite there yet, but one of these days, and see, what I found out about life, it's sneaky. It is so sneaky, it's scary. 
I'm looking at myself and said, man, age done snuck up on me. And I've been waiting for that great day when I'm going to finally get it all together. I think it loses like a carrot in front of a horse. <laughs> we chase it but never get it. So I, I feel that there is no simple. Well, there is a simple answer. But we don't like simple answers. I get up and preach you the answer today and we can leave in, in less than five minutes. But if I gave you the answer, you're going to want me to explain it, right? <laughs> then you're going to want me to put it in a diagram and, and, and chalk it all over with you, will you? Tell the truth. If I gave you the answer, you're going to want me to explain, well, how does that work? Because we don't want to work nothing we ain't tried yet ourselves and what's really bad is that we're trying to work stuff we ain't never tried and it ain't never worked for us and it ain't worked for nobody else give me a few minutes though here I'm going to let you go I praise God God is good and you brave this, this little small heat wave we got praise God when the time has hit us again I told someone this morning on the phone I said you know after 69 years you should be used to this isn't it funny how a lot of things you never get used to in life, nobody, even though you lived through it all your life? Hmm? See, that's, that's what gets me is that people are locked up in time. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to move on. We're so locked up in time that people have the, have the thought that this year is going to be different than last year. Could I tell y'all, if you wasn't happy last year, 2022 got the same thing 2021 had in it. If you didn't find happiness then, chances are January the 1st, you still ain't found it. I'm going to say hit this and quit it. You're not going to believe it, but God ain't really on the time max. He ain't even looking at your calendar. Hmm? Oh, you thought God changes in 2020? God says, I am God, I change not. So a different year don't change him. And I know for a fact a different year ain't changed you either. <laughs> because if you were stressing last year, chances are today, you may have a little relief today because it's Sunday. But come tomorrow morning, all those feelings you had in 2021 probably will be right back. If you was at odds with your, with your boss man, you probably at odds with him now. The only thing that changed was the calendar, and that was it. God didn't change because it turned to 2022. I heard too many people getting up, prophesying, and all prophet lying. Oh, this is a year. God's going to do it. Look here, God is not trying to do anything. God has already done what he's going to do. He said it is finished. And what you need to realize, God ain't fitting to do nothing. We got to recognize what God has already done. Well, you know, God's going to pour, God's going to be pouring out blessings in 2022. If you didn't catch him in 2021, you couldn't believe in them 2021. You didn't believe in them 2019. You didn't believe in 2015. You didn't believe in 1999. I'm not living in the finished two. I'm living, I'm living in the finished work of Christ. I'm not looking for God to move. He's already moved. He just need to get in you so you can know he moved. Well, anyway, praise God. I know that said, oh, crazy the bald head, reach again. Always try to make people mad. No, I'm not. But I've lived too long in this to sit there and play patty cake with stuff I know he's already done. I keep telling people all the time, you'll be amazed what can happen with a thank you. 
you, if you ain't thankful, you ain't even holy. Because the Bible said they became unthankful. And when they became unthankful, they became unholy. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to preach just a little bit. Praise God. I ain't making nobody mad but the devil. <laughs> I ain't making nobody mad but the man. I've had people come out against it, man. They get mad when you say, God is love. You can't, you're preaching too much love. Well, you tell me I'm preaching too much God? Huh? How in the world could you preach about God and not preach about his love? Because he tell you, I, God, is love. Oh, man, they got too much love going on. Now, now, don't get it wrong now. God loves you, but he'll kill you. We have not, I got to say this. If you think God's love is going to kill you, you haven't seen his love yet. Because his love is what killed him. So that you could live. Huh? What joy can he get putting double punishment on you? It's called double jeopardy. If Jesus Christ has been judged for you, then if he judge you again, it's called double jeopardy. How many of you know you go to courthouse and, 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 and they put you up for murder and somehow you got away? You probably committed the murder. Do you know they can't come back later on? Well, I better not use murder because that's one they can't come back. Okay, some of y'all know about lying. <laughs> I'll make it a lesser crime. Lying. They can't come back and charge you with that again. How many of you know all your sins was judged in Christ? He can't come back and judge you again on a sin that you've been forgiven of. Bro, well, no, I, don't, I don't know about all that. Well, either Jesus did or he didn't. We need to recognize either he forgave all or he forgave none. Our whole problem today is trying to make God do something he's already done. That's why we want him to get all the bad people. We don't realize he died for them too. What did the Bible say? He bore their sins, all their sins, where did he bear them at? In his body. If you can find that, you'll find his sin. Your sin and everybody else's. John chapter 6, verse 51, 54. Let me get off of that. I, I, I believe that we got to get again and again this revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done. Otherwise, you'll be working on your salvation the rest of your life. But when you find out the work has been completed, then you can live in peace with God because you can't live in peace with God because you're still trying to figure out what to do with your wrongness. Cast all. How many? Now, how many people do that? Just keep looking here. John 6, 51 said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. In other words, he's telling you something here. He was not the man in the wilderness that, that came from earth. We don't know where the manna came from. We just know how it tastes. We know it has some flavors of earth. Tasted like honey. Them little cakes, whatever they were, had a little honey in them, everything like that. But they didn't come from heaven. They didn't really come from heaven. They came from earth. But it was God's special diet for his people. Now, Jesus said, I, but I'm the living word. Because okay. you can eat that which came from earth, and it will satisfy you, but you will die. Okay. No matter how much you eat of it, it's still, you're going to die. But he said, but I am that living word that came from heaven. Anything that comes from heaven is not there on a time base. It's eternal. Right? Nothing that you receive from heaven is time. Everything God gives you is eternal. Every blessing God gives you is an eternal blessing. All right? He's not giving you 
peace for a time. When you get the peace of God, you get eternal peace. Oh, hallelujah. God is not giving you mercy on, a, on time. He gives you eternal grace. He gives you eternal mercy. Everything I'm going to receive from God in the form of a blessing is eternal. Nothing can change it. So he said, if any man eat of this bread, how long will he live? Have you ate the bread? Well, it's, it's a trick question here. I know some people said they ate the bread, but they're not sure they're going to be saved. He said, if you eat this bread, you're going to live three scores and ten. I hear people bragging about, boy, God promised me three scores and ten. That's because you're eating earth matter. But the Bible said when you eat the manna that came from heaven, it's not three scores and ten no more. It's not even four scores. If I eat the manna that came from heaven, then I'm going to live eternal. Oh, praise God. Well, I don't think, I don't know about them. I know, I know. And the bread that I'll give you, give, is. Wow. I can't, you know, God can be so confusing. He can be so confusing. Because now we can't buy that in a grocery store. Can you? And I know some of you say, well, this, he wasn't talking about this either. He had a bread before this that came from heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that word was made flesh. And he says that now the bread I'm going to give you is going to be my flesh. I'm, I'm going to pray, God. I'm going to let you sit down. I know that you may have stand a while because I've got to get into this. Precious God, open our hearts. As we open our hearts, feed us, Lord, with that heavenly manna. Lord, with revelation and wisdom today in Jesus' name, amen. You go ahead and sit down. I, I won't make you stand like that. But here he said, I'll, I'll give you this flesh to eat. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tell you that I'm really brilliant, smart, and all that kind of stuff, because if I went down here and read that, most of the time we've read a lot of things in the Bible, we never stop to think what he might have said. So we just rolled over. And then we were, we hugged the Bible as though we hugged Jesus. And, and we, many of you have, I know, have read through the Bible, gobbled it up. We ate so much of it the first time, we don't even want to read it no more. Because <laughs> if we thought the Bible was what he was talking about eating, because most people do not miss three meals a day. If I thought that this was going to be my eternal life, totally my eternal life, I probably push back the eggs and steak and eat this first. Wow, that got quiet. If this was the meat or the bread that's going to bring me eternal life then there ain't no way I'm going to miss a day. I'm going to gobble up as much of this as I can. I'm going to even try to probably read this, because the way I eat, see, I, I like smokers, boy. I used to, not now, but I used to love smokers, boy. And when you like smokers, boy, you, you don't want no little snack. 
I will want to have a hunger for God that will make me want to eat this up every day. I mean, just put, the, put sugar on it, whatever I need to, to eat it every day. But just like you and I, the Bible said the Jews had a problem with that. The Bible said the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh? to eat I think that's, that's a pretty good question I think I would have been asking the same thing if I was walking with him and you know and knowing the Bible like I know the Bible know what the word of God says have you ever tried to correct God with his word huh have you of course you have. I hear a lot of y'all even saying, God, you know what you said. You said in the Bible, that, 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 that. And so you try to correct him with his, with his own word as if he didn't know it was his word. Even my kids do that. But dad, you say it. Yeah, I know I say it. And so we try to go to God and correct him with his own word because now they understand the Bible. And here is Jesus coming to them, talking about doing something that's restricted. That's the name of this message, living in the restricted zone. Here the Lord comes and offer something that's definitely not kosher. Let me keep reading here. I'll be right back. Then Jesus said, and very really I said, you accept you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now all of a sudden, see they were having a good time with Jesus because I tell you what, as long as he's feeding you naturally, you want to follow him. He had fishes and loaves, man, you know what? Man, when the word got out, 5,000 was one day, and the next day the word got out, free food, free fish. Ain't nothing like a fish fry on Friday. When they heard that there's free fish and free bread being given out, man, they flocked, they came, they ran. Oh, man, Jesus serving. We got JJ's open the day, fish fry. And it was all falling for that. Well, see, Jesus sometimes has to come to us naturally to lead us to something greater called spiritual. So he already knows sometimes no matter how spiritual you say you are, he's got to feed that natural side just so you keep coming. Right? So they, they heard what he said. All of a sudden, there was a backsliding problem. People were with it. When their needs, their natural needs were being met, they were with it. But then he changes the, the whole uh, gamut of things and said, No, I know you follow me now. The reason why you follow me so long, you've been eating fishes and loaves. And you got satisfied and you got happy. He said, But I didn't want, I, I, I'm not really on that. I want to take you a little bit forth. You enjoyed my miracle that you have so testified about. Oh, God. Yeah, he, he, I didn't have no food. <laughs> he put food on the table. Yeah, he sure did. I feel you. Because he got to keep you fed so you can get strength. But he want to give you more than food on the table. Somebody said, yeah, he put clothes on my back. You ain't going to believe it. He had a bigger clothing to put on you than the clothes on your back. Because the Bible said he wanted to clothe you in his 
righteousness. And so here you are testifying about the natural things that really will have no bearings in the end. Genesis chapter 9, verse 4 said, But flesh with life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. They knew that. They knew the Bible said, You are not supposed to eat meat with blood in it. Even to this day, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people take everything to heart. Take it literally. And if we were supposed to be literally not eating flesh with blood in it, many of us be in trouble. Uh -oh. I said, if you wanted to be literal, most stuff we eat today, we wouldn't be able to eat. We don't drain. I, I, I worked in a slaughterhouse. Last thing we're trying to do is get all the blood out. We want as much water and blood in as we can because it makes it way more. So we'd already be behind the eight ball. Because of this scripture here. And these Jews knew exactly what the Bible said about blood and how sacred it was. Matter of fact, even today, they, they drain them cows. They drain whatever they're going to be eating. They're supposed to be draining that stuff. Not one drop of blood left in it at all because it's an abomination to eat meat with blood in it. I know you're looking at me and saying, Brother Wilson, how do you eat your steak? That's my business. Uh, that's my business. Because I think even this statement, he was trying to take them a lot deeper than they wanted to go. See, most of the time we read stuff on the surface and God had a whole, a whole nother reason why it was in there. So we need to understand why it's in there. See, we, we, we look at these things like this and Jesus kept ramming home that point. I'm the bread of life. Eat my flesh. After a while, that's going to get old. So we look at things confused so because we form our opinions based upon a lot of matters that we don't fully understand, but yet our opinions seem to matter most. I've heard people say, well, you know, God don't, you know, how do you know what God likes and don't like if you never talk to him yourself? How would you ever know what God likes for your life if you've never talked to him? Because it seemed to me in this book, there's a lot of people that he almost showed partiality to. I don't know what really God likes or don't like of not talking to him. He may like one thing for my life that he may not like for yours. There may be things that he like in yours, I don't like in mine. I have no idea. But I see all the characters in the Bible seem to be different. There seem to be when God places a no on a situation, it seems to be he means no. And then he'll turn around and I see something else that seems to, to uh, backtrack his no and allow. So I think it's very it, it's needful for us to have a real, relationship with God to know just exactly what is. We, we got a lot of religions being founded upon past ideas. Handed down ideas. Handed down traditions. And I can see why Jesus said because of your tradition you made the word of God null and void. We have put so much strength in such religious tradition Jesus ain't even got to be in none of it, but we're going to try to put him in it anyway and get mad if nobody else got him in it. Most of the time we have not seen the unfolded progressiveness of God 
in our restoration back to where God wanted us to be. There seem to be too many hindrances in our lives that try to abort his restoring power. See, most people think God want to restore you back to the time when you was born when you were about five years old and hadn't done nothing wrong. Could I tell you at five years old you were just as lost as you are now? But we don't realize that God needed to restore humankind back all the way to the beginning. God's activity with man needs to be restored back to the beginning. If we're not walking and we're not talking with him, then we have not been restored yet. Not to where God wants you. It should be a daily thing with God's people that we are walking and talking with him. We are discovering in him things that God has already prepared for us. We should be thanking God every day when we discover something God has already put in our life. We didn't even know it was there. We didn't even know how much strength God had given us till we felt weak. We had no idea how much peace God had given us until we fell into chaos. Had no idea how much grace we had until we really needed grace. Not knowing that every day that we wake up, everything that we need is already here. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. But somehow we have the idea that if I can take the hand-me-down type religion, that it's going to enforce a new dimension in God. We're still doing the same stuff, and don't, don't feel bad because I know you're getting the same thing. We're still asking God the same questions. And we still got the same answers. See, Jesus said, I'm a living bread. And I came down from heaven. I'm, I'm a living bread. This bread is not a day old. It's not a week old. The bread God wants you to eat is a living word, a living bread. That's why the Bible say that, the, that he gives us our daily how many? What have we been eating? If God is giving daily bread, how often are we eating? I hear people talking about I need a word from God. No, he sends you a daily bread. And if the bread has been eaten, the Bible even said the crumb, the bread is for the healing of the children. If I'm eating a daily consumption of bread, there has to be some healing going on in my life. There's got to be something happening inside of me if I'm consuming that living bread. Most of us have a dead testimony, a yesteryear testimony. We got a yesterday word, but we're trying to live today. But it seemed to me like Jesus, when he got on a point, he just kept running it. He just kept plying with it. You, you would think that somehow he would back up a little bit. It wasn't enough that he probably was looking at these guys turning green. Some of them going over to the side, trying to throw up. Because the very thought you know, I've watched the National Geographic. They had a tribe over in Africa where they take and when they kill the animal, they take and fill these vessels up with the blood. They keep stirring it and stirring it so it won't coagulate. I think they add a little something in it. And they just keep stirring it and stirring it. And, of course, if you're a guest, 
You know, you get the first drink. I will not lie to you. And see, if you don't, it's disrespect. When they pass that big jug, they've been stirring that blood around. When they pass it to you, you got to have red on your lips when you bring it down. Or they're going to feel like you disrespected them. You may be, it may be your blood next. But I think about that and I said, man, at, I almost pass out when I see my own blood. To think that somehow I could sit down and pick a big old pitcher of cow blood and drink it like a cocktail, I don't think I can do it. I, I don't think it's in me. I think I was started throwing up. Brother Pope, I don't think I can. You can handle it? You, you, you could? Could you handle that? Yeah, you probably could, but I can't. I get queasy now just thinking about it. I'm going to lump in my throat. You think I'm drinking something. I ain't drinking nothing right now. It's just in the mind. But here Jesus, he kept driving home the point. He said, for my flesh is meat. Have you found that? Have you found the meat? He said, because it's meat indeed and my blood is drink. He that eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me and I in him. There's something about his dinner table that doesn't look like mine. There's something about what he's serving in him. It's not the same thing that's been served outside of him. There's a lot of things that gets us excited, but nothing should get us more excited than being able to sit down and sup with him. If any man would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him. I wonder what is he serving. If I go in to sup with him, I know exactly what I'm going to be eating. His bread and his blood is going to be entree and dessert. There's nothing else on the table. See, over 4,000 years, these Jews had looked and seen the abomination of eating blood and drinking blood and eating flesh with blood. And then all of a sudden, God comes in and hands him down this thing, said, now you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. God, are you asking me to become a cannibal? You know this is not right, God. You know this is not. We ain't even supposed to even think about eating flesh with blood. You know, sometimes, you know, our, our tradition gets us in trouble. I love them. I think they have their places probably. But it was like the Rechabites, I think, over in the book, of Jeremiah, they had their father's father, and all of them had been like priesthood, and they had sworn they would never, had like a Nazarite vow, never touch wine or anything. And they had been so true to that. And then God sent a prophet to them and told them, tell them it's okay to drink some wine. They had not drinking wine from their grandfather, their father to them. They had traditionally now made it a point, we're never going to do that. And, of course, it had been handed down to them. They didn't know because a lot of things handed down to us, we didn't know either. We just believed it because somebody said it. We never really heard it from God, but somebody told us that God said it, so we believed that God said it, and so we stayed the course. I understand that. And I understand that these traditions had created stability. 
The tradition gave identity. The tradition also gives us limitations and boundaries. Some of them are not good. I, I understand. You know, I, I, I love it. I wanted to establish a tradition in my family where we get together once a year. I wanted to be a tradition. Is that bad? No, that's good. I think we all need to have some time to get together with family. But, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking in my mind, and I had, I remember not too long ago, I had one of my preacher friends was asking me about prayer because we talk, Christian people talk more about prayer than McDonald's do about hamburgers. And I think we talk a lot about it, but to be honest with you, I think we understand it less than we want to say we do. I really do. And I, I'm not saying that because I think I'm an expert in prayer. I don't. I have no idea. I, I know people walk with the Lord and they was asking him to teach them how to pray. So evidently he wasn't praying like everybody else was. Because there's one thing about the Jewish people. They knew how to pray. But there was something different about the way Jesus prayed that when they heard him pray, they said, Lord, teach us. Now we, we, we thought we knew how. Because we've been praying day and night. Every day we pray, every day we pray, and yet Jesus shows up, and then all of a sudden they hear him praying. They said, oh, we've been praying, but Lord, evidently, how you praying and we've been praying ain't the same. Because they was praying like most people today. They prayed, but they got no results. In their synagogue, they prayed, but no results. You had people there that had withered hands. You had people there that had been bowled over. They prayed with no results. Something about Jesus, he come in. He didn't spend an hour praying for the service. Did he? No, he just went in. Because he knew he was the service. We don't ever have to pray for God to do what God does. We just need to pray that we step out the way so God can be God. Because most of the time when we pray, we're trying to make God be like us. Lord, I want you to bless these lips of clay and all that. Please get off of that. Let Jesus shows up. He already got the service in hand. He already knows what you have need of. So we've been programmed. He said, Bishop, he said, how has God been doing you about praying? I said, man, he, he dealt with me about praying quite some time ago. Because we're reading that where he says, when most people... They think if they pray long, they get better results. We make long prayers for show. How many long prayers did Jesus pray? Hmm? How many? I don't think he prayed one that lasted longer than five minutes. If he prayed five minutes. It's funny how when he came out, he came out with answers. Seemed like his prayer took him into a whole other dimension. When he prayed, he came back with answers. He came back knowing. He knew what was going on when he came back out of prayer. But we pray going in not knowing. And we come back out still not knowing. And we got too many people saying, but I prayed. But God ain't answered. Let me tell you something. We got to get in the restricted zone now. You know why most people don't get prayers answered? 
is because we set them up so they can't. We made people believe that they have no business really being in the presence of God until we create it. Bear with me. We got people set up that can't go in the restricted zone. See, there is under the law, there's a lot of restriction. But one of the greatest restrictions the law had was it kept you from having access to God. You couldn't go. So the Pope, you wouldn't be able to go. Okay. You'd have to live outside the restricted zone. All your doings for God would have to be outside the restricted zone because he had a zone. And he had a big veil that separated only one man could go into that restricted zone. And once a year at that. And he couldn't come without blood. And so he had to go in that. Even, see, really, you weren't supposed to even touch a dead carcass or a dead carcass. And that dead blood on you really disqualified you. But God allowed that one man. To come into the restricted zone with the blood. And so here he would go in, he'd come back out, and you'd be all happy because somebody was able to do something that you weren't able to do. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. And so here behind that veil was all the glory. And many people today want to give God glory. But you first got to behold glory to give glory. And where we're trying to operate from, there is no real glory, not the glory God wants. There is glory that's fading. That's the glory that's outside the restricted zone. But there is a glory that it's the glory of God and God wants you to behold his glory so that you can give him glory. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I've got, I realized a long time ago, the biggest excuse in my life is me. I realize I'm the biggest problem that God has is me. Because, see, glory, when you start to really beholding his glory, you're going to lose something in yourself. There's something about him wanting to fill you with his glory. You remember he said, I give my glory to none else. We try to create a glory that will top his. But only way you're ever going to have his glory, you're going to be in the presence of God where his glory is. Oh, hallelujah. Mm, mm, mm. You see, over in the book of Revelation, I, I was reading this morning, it was talking about when God was bringing judgment upon the earth and all these kind of things. And, and uh, you know, we get stuck, so stuck, man, even when God is... Is doing some things to bring it to our attention. We still won't change our mind about God. See, most people think their repentance is about telling God, I'm sorry for my sin. Well, he already know that. Being sorry for my sin don't always change me, does it? Because when I get rid of one, I'll find another one. <laughs> huh? we, just, we just recover it. So it's, it's not enough for you to say, I'm sorry. But the real repentance in the Bible has a lot to do with your mind. If you don't change your mind about God, you can, get, you can be at the altars every day 
come here talking about how sorry you are about your sin. But ain't helped you none, ain't going to help you not at all until there has to be a change of mind. The Bible said God started pouring all kind of stuff out on them, just throwing all kind of judgment up on them. And then there was a, then the Bible said, I heard another out of the altar say, even so, Lord Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgment. In other words, everything you do is good. Everything God does is good. I don't think you heard me. Everything that God does is good. Everything that God allows. Man, not only do you hurl up the devil on that one, boy, boy, he sure kill a lot of saints with that, don't he? I said, everything God allows is good. Everything about God is good. Because God is good. Oh, hallelujah. Not only are they good, but they are true and they are righteous. So we need to understand, whatever God does, it's about you getting your mind changed. Yes, he allowed things to come. Why? Not to destroy you, but he wants you to change your mind. There's a lot of people whose mind been set in tradition so strong, even when God gets through doing it, they won't change their mind. That was these people. But they didn't realize he was doing it for their sake. And so they would not repent. They wouldn't change their mind. They wouldn't give him glory. And you know why? The Bible said they blasphemed. Listen to this now. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores. See, we think we glorify God by telling everybody how bad we hurt. We think we're glorifying God, y'all. Yeah, I almost didn't make it, but y'all pray. You're not glorifying God. God is not getting glory out of that. If you got in his presence, you wouldn't be talking about how much pain you got. If you got in his restricted zone, you would no longer talk about how sore you are. If you got in his presence, you're going to find out all this stuff that you've been going through, you didn't have to go through because in his presence there is fullness of joy at his right hand pleasures forevermore. If you got in his presence. Brother Thorne was preaching last Sunday. And I know, man, a lot of stuff goes over people's head a lot of times. I'm going to tell you something. There is a whole nother dimension to be in God. There is a place where God really does do the fighting and you do the resting. There is a place in God where there is peace that passes all understanding. It don't just come on Sunday, but it's every day of your life. There is a place in God where you will be strong in him and not in yourself. There is a place in God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We think that God is trying to keep us out of his presence. We got people talk, telling God how bad they are. We already know that. It's going to take more than a new suit and a new pair of shoes to make you a good person. God already knows you can't camouflage your messed upness. But he knows this here. It doesn't matter how messed up you are. It's how good he is. Because everything about God is good. You won't know it's good until you get with God. Oh, hallelujah. Man, as if, as if we're surprised by ourselves. Bible tells you there dwelleth no good thing. And you keep saying, Lord, you just don't know. You don't know what I'm going through. He ain't, he, 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 the Holy Ghost ain't saying that. I bet you the Holy Ghost ain't talking that. Uh -oh. I know we said I, I received the Holy Ghost I spoke in tongue and Spirit, God gave utterance why don't you let God give you some utterance now 
You'll never find the Holy Ghost in you talking about how bad it is. You'll never find the Holy Ghost in you talking about, man, I got my hurt. Y'all pray for me. The Holy Ghost is not going to be doing that. No. No, you told me he let you speak in tongues before. Why don't you let him let you speak now? Let the Spirit of God speak through you now. Speak to your problem. I don't believe God has lost any kind of power whatsoever. Praise God. You see, I don't know why we think that God can't do what he said. I don't know why. When did we ever get tricked into doubting that God can't do what he said? Who told you you was naked? When, when the last time you spoke to God, did God say you was naked? Huh? Did he tell you it was naked? Then why did you let somebody tell you that you can't make it? Why is it somebody can tell you stuff and make you doubt your God? Let me tell you something. I ain't heard God tell you I was naked. Matter of fact, I heard God tell me, I have clothed you in my righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, praise God. I heard him say those things to me. I, you can't tell me how right I am because I'm only right as I am in him. Oh, hallelujah. Man, I forgot. Let me slow down. Give me a few more minutes. You see, I don't know of anybody that hasn't failed or won't fail. But here's what I'm going to tell you that did or will. He won't. <laughs> could, I tell you, could I say that? I said, he won't. You, you, you may miss, but he won't. You may not show up, but he will. Oh, praise God. Uh, I don't know. I, I, you don't know how bad I've been. Look here. You're looking at the wrong one. It's not your badness that brings you to repentance. It's not how bad you are about you. That's a fake repentance. The real repentance is when you recognize how good he is. For it's his goodness that brings me to repentance. And when he, that goodness changes my mind about God. Have you ever went through a trial? And, 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 and it was his goodness in the trial that caused you to see God bigger than he's ever was? Have you ever suffered with cancer and God healed you of cancer and all of a sudden it's his goodness that changes my mind about God? Do you wonder why I'm so crazy? The reason why I'm so crazy right now because he changed my mind. I have people all the time trying to tell me, yeah, bro, Wilson, no, don't take it too far. What do you mean? We've got to have a brand new mind. Let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in you. You would never have the mind of Christ and walk around talking about, woe is me. Oh, everybody hates me and everybody against me. You would never have the mind of Christ talking like that. Here was David. Here was David. Man, he got, you talking about a man living with a revelation. This dude had a revelation. Woo. He realized some things, man. God done been hid in the restricted zone and ain't nobody going after him. That's why God's always talking about seek me because he's living in a restricted zone and most people get close but would not go. Because it's a scary thing. Most people want to seek God today. They want to seek him, but they don't want to find him. You know why I know that? Because he said, even then, he said, I'm not thee. Even in your mouth. The word. I tell you, well, you got to start speaking life. Huh? See, you, you can't get God's attention speaking death. God does not understand that negativity stuff. You're never going to get God's attention by crying in fear like that. You're not going to get his attention like that. Because he has not given you the spirit of fear. All right? 
So don't come to him talking about I got the Holy Ghost scared half to death. You're not, when you go to God, you got to come with him so he can talk to you. How is he going to do that? By your spirit. He said, all these things I made known unto you by my spirit. It's not by power, not by might, but it's by my spirit, says God. But David got a revelation. As messed up as he was. If there ever was a man that needed to hide from God, he needed to hide. But the dude got a revelation. He got a boldness that scares a lot of people. He went and got a tent. He put the restricted zone in his front yard. And had the audacity not only put it there, pulled the size up, and told the people, come on and praise him. Come on and worship God. Can you imagine how scary that is? Because time before in his life, somebody touched it and got killed. Here is David, got this ark sitting in the front yard. Blue light special going on all night long. And people around there praising and worshiping God. Giving God glory. Why could they give him glory? Because they was in the presence of God where glory is. Well, praise God. See, David found the secret to his strength. It's time for you to find the secret to your strength. It's not that you go to gym every day. It's not because you ate the right foods every day. Your real strength is God. The only strength you need is God's strength. The same strength that laid everything out. It's God's power. That's all you need. David said, glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. I hate, I hate to say this, and, and I, I, trust me, I'm not mad. I'm not even hungry this morning. I'm not even tired. But, but it, it, it is really kind of rough sometimes when now, I, I've been around, like I said, for a while, 40 something years in this. It has amazed me how we are so afraid. We're afraid of God being God in everybody's life. I, tell you, I remember when I first started. And I felt like Head honcho. I felt like God didn't need to talk to nobody in the church but me. I'll tell you what the Lord said. Let's keep looking this way. I felt like that. I, I remember, you know, people getting hungry. You know, they go buy some books and they go come to me and say, Brother Wilson, this, is this a good book? And guess what? Did it have my name on it? <laughs> and we say stuff to them like this. You, you probably, I don't think you're ready for this book right here. I got a couple books on my shelf right now that I Got from some people because they said, well, you don't think I'm ready for it? No, I don't think you're ready for it. Because I don't want you to get too much of God. Because if you get too much of God, it may come like, show me up. So I, I want you to learn at the level I'm teaching you. So what we done, we, we censored. 
We censored what God would say to people. Because if God spoke to you, you need to tell me what God said so I can tell you whether it was God or not. Y'all quiet. Y'all may experience some of this stuff. Because you come to me and say, you know, well, listen, the Lord, I believe the Lord spoke to me and I'll tell you right quick because if it's, if it's really challenging me, I don't believe God told you that. Mm-hmm. Well, at least I'm, I'm, I'm honest. Because there's a lot of people today sitting in church don't believe if the preacher didn't say it, God couldn't have said it. And a lot of things we're saying in these pulpits, God ain't even spoke a word. I've seen the same prophecies coming from 2020, 2020 2021, 2022. I see these same guys going to prophesy the same thing they prophesied the year before. This is a year. Year of prosperity. This is a year of double portions, but they don't mean spirit, though. You're going to achieve. None of these things that prophesying about today has anything to do with the spirit. I'm kind of wondering why is it that God would give you the Holy Ghost but can't talk to you? Why would he give you the power of prayer and it don't work? Some of us right here are sitting right now. We feel worthless. Feel like we ain't got nothing. We feel empty. And yet all the time, God is saying, I want to be your strength. I, I, I want to be your strength. But you see, you can't give him your strength because, see, what happened, we learned how to make so many fleshy excuses. They sold us on a bunch of them. Man, you know, if you ain't living right, and what that means, I don't have any idea because there's only one way to live, and that's a righteous living, and that's got to be by faith because any other way is self-righteous. That's the reason why most people are getting confused now because they're trying to live right or what they say living right and ain't nothing happening for them right. First time something wrong goes on in their life, first they want to remind God, well, you know I'm trying to live right. And all God is trying to tell you, can you accept my righteousness? Can you accept my right for you? Because I have already lived for you. So you can live with me. And we got to twist it up. I'm living for God so he can live with me. No, he already lived for you so you can live with him. He don't need you to do for him. He came to do for you. It was him that went to Calvary for you. It was him that died on the cross for you. It was him that was buried for you. It was him that raised up. You know why? For you. Is that hard? And here you are getting headaches trying to figure out what you're going to do for him. Why don't you accept first what he has done for you? Almost. So here is we making all these excuses because of our wretchedness. We think that God ain't gonna bless you. You was wretched when He found you. If you were that wretched, He'd have left you. There was not one wretched person on earth that could not have this salvation. You couldn't get dirty enough not to get it because it all was placed in His blood. The covenant. In his blood, that restrictionary. So, there's something about, you know, his glory. 
And I think if you'd ask a thousand people what it is, we'd all have a different concept. Just keep looking this way. There's no test today. I ain't, ain't no quiz. You're not going to be made right out chances. But isn't it strange that when we say giving God glory, how we have anticipated what glory is? You know, I always like to know, I'm sorry, as me, I know we got a lot of words we use. We're not familiar with what they really mean. I can remember always since I've been in church, we say glory, give God glory. You know, and we started singing good. You hear somebody in the background say, give him glory. We have all kinds of anticipation on him getting glory and how the glory is passed out. But I do believe there is a place in God where glory is. That's where all your needs are met. All your needs are met in glory. So it would behoove me to find out where glory is so I can get all my needs met. See, I'm troubled in my spirit because I see too many people trying to get stuff outside of glory. We got too many people standing on the outside of the veil trying to give God glory that won't last. That's why one Sunday you'll be up because you got paid. The next Sunday you got fired and he can't get no glory. <laughs> give him glory. No, no, I just lost my job. They're getting ready to repossess my car. All that, you, you know, that's not glory time, is it? No, uh, but the day before, you, you had like a, a little bonus. And man, did you shout. I want to give you glory. Can I tell you, before you try to give it to him, won't you let him give it to you? And I know you're asking yourself, how can I do that? I'm getting ready to tell you. I'm getting ready to close. Almost. Almost. I don't want y'all to get your hopes up too high. You see, I begin to realize here is David. This dude came from the basement of adultery up to murder. But you know what? He knew about glory. Do you, do you realize some of us need to change our address? Because where we live, there is no glory. You remember say, in his place there was honor and glory and all that. But where we live, there is none. You see, somehow David realized, I got to get beyond me. I, I can't stay just with me. You see, he moved to Psalm 911. He that dwelleth not visit. Because, <laughs> cause, believe it or not, we have gotten so traditional that we want a Sunday visitation. But not Monday. But David said, I found a secret. He that dwelleth in the secret place 
of the Most High. He that dwelleth, he that stays there. We have prayed prayers that were not in the secret place. Because I believe that when we get in the secret place, we get to know some secrets. Huh? A lot of things that you're not aware of right now, in the secret place, I believe there are secrets given. That's where I begin to realize who he is. I got to pray myself into this restricted zone. This was places nobody could go. But now God desires for all to come. That's why he said, if any man thirst, let him come. Come on in. I got blood. I got bread. Come on in. David realized that when he got in the secret place of the Most High God, he found that he is my refuge. Yeah, the storms are rising, all kind of things are happening, things are falling down, but I found out when I get in the secret place of God, he becomes my refuge. Chase me into the refuge. Let your troubles run you into the refuge of God. He's my fortress. Nothing can penetrate the fortress of God. He is my deliverer. Nothing can hold me. He's my shield and buckler. My protector. He is my healer. Some people are asking today, can we still be healed? Yes, but I'm going to tell you where you're going to know where the healing is. It's not going to be on outside. It's going to be in the presence of God and where his glory is. What the Bible say? I shall supply all of your needs according to my riches in where? In glory. That's not a need that you have. That if you get in the presence of God, that you won't know the answer is there. Oh, hallelujah. He's my covering. He is my habitation. It's time for the people of God to not just say glory, but it's time to get in glory. It's good. Get glory out your mouth. Glory. We need glory because we need to be in his glory. Mm -mm -mm. See, the Lord moves us into that restricted zone. Allowed us to. And many still feel like it's still restricted. If you're praying for somebody, if you're praying for anybody, go into the restricted zone. Say, I don't know how to pray. Go into the restricted zone. I don't believe that God would invite you in and let you leave with a question mark in your mind. Amen. I don't believe you're going to be in the presence of God and pray and, and, and come back out saying, I don't know what to do. Sorry. I don't believe you can get in the presence of God and come back ignorant. I just don't believe that. I don't believe that God that's never placed, every place you read in this Bible, where the Lord showed up and somebody was in his presence, every one of them walked away with a word from God. Whether it be Daniel, whether it be John the Revelator, everybody that showed up in his presence did not walk away scratching their head talking about, I don't know what God is doing. One with issue of blood showed up in his presence, guess what she found out? He's a healer. Oh, praise God. Oh, yeah, lame man showed up. Guess what he found out? Ha, he's a healer. Demoniac. Guess what he found out? He's a deliverer. 
And here we are today, and these people did not have the Holy Ghost like you got, and you're telling me we're going to show up in the presence of God and not walk away saying the same thing these people said because they found Jesus. When Daniel came out from the Lord, the Lord showed him the end time revelation. When John got in the presence of God, he showed him the end time revelation. Now, here. Will somebody please tell me how are we going in the presence of God and we're walking away still don't know what to do. Oh, hallelujah. See, we're going to have to learn. I don't, I don't like to just use scriptures anymore, just use scriptures. It's exciting. As a preacher, man, I, I, I know, I know, uh, I love to get people excited, you know, and get all, get you all hyped up. And every place, the soles of your feet shall touch. It's yours. Knowing that it sounds good, but they ain't walking no place but back home. And then they're going to touch anything spiritually. I found that place. But it's not literal. It's not these shoe leather shoes. Every place I can allow my soul to walk in God, I can possess it. Come on, I'm going to raise clothes with this. Some of you are thinking, well, I've been trying to get peace in my life. Can your soul walk in that? Because if your soul can walk in it, I promise you, you can possess that. Huh? Man, I want to walk in the joy. Do you? You see, the only problem with this is that if these things start working in me, something got to stop working for me. Don't worry about it, Jesus. Come on, I'm going to stand. You're going to stand. I've got to pray. I messed around and started sweating on my head. I didn't intend to break a sweat today. You see, I, I, I'm not telling anybody how to. I'm not telling you what to do. Because I found out one thing. It doesn't matter how much teaching you get. It doesn't matter how much preaching you hear. Eventually, it's your mind that has to change. I, I can tell you testimonies about how God can heal and all that. That's all well and good. But, you know, that, that, that testimony ain't going to work for you until you know for yourself that he is. That's why the Bible is so strong in saying, know the Lord. That's why God will proclaim to you, I am God. And I got a couple more. No? He said, I'm God. And there's none, none other. What do you see? Do you have another option in your life right now? Because if you got another option, you probably don't know that he is God and there's not another. Usually what happened with God is that we got to work out. We got to let them other little gods wear us out trying to keep them up. Uh, like he said, man, they, they take it and pull a piece of wood and tack it down and all kind of stuff. And then when they come, they can't talk. To your, your little gods can't even talk to you. They can't heal you. You can rub them and shine them and do all that kind of stuff. But when it comes down to it, when you really need them little gods that you done made, they can't help you. He said, I'm God all by myself. Everything I do, I do it all by myself. I don't need no help. I'm a God that never gets hungry, and if I did, I wouldn't even ask you for bread. Here we are today. I want to talk, tell you one more time. We know where we have been. 
One of the hardest things to do is to step from there to where he is. You know what I'm saying? It's the hardest thing you're ever going to do. Because we are not used to being in his glory. We're not used to God speaking to us and telling us things that we need to know. We'd rather hear it from somebody else. Tell me, what did God say? God tell you anything about me? God is not a gossiper. He ain't gossiping to somebody else about your life. He's trying to change you. And the only way he can change you, he has to be able to speak to you. Let's pray. Precious God, I thank you. Lord, as we begin to enter into our times of prayer, Lord, don't let us come up short. Let us go on over into what has been known to us, a restricted area, where we can sit down and really partake of your flesh and your blood. God, I pray today that somehow in this house that souls are being touched by your spirit, being led by your spirit to places they've never been. God, I give you all the praise and all the glory today. I thank you in advance for what you've already done. I thank you, dear God, that you've already given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, Lord, I pray as you breathe life into us, breathe in life into us once again, that, Lord, we be like David, dwelling in your secret place. God, that we might know who you really are in us. And in all these things, we give you thanks today, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today. I would pray that somehow that you would understand. There, don't, don't, don't settle for not knowing when God wants you to know. God wants you to know. All right? That's not one thing going on in your life that God don't want you to know about that he can talk about. All right? Talk to God. Please. Would you please talk to him? God bless you.